right. Well, let's go ahead and, and begin. Um, if you've been noticing the news, if you watch the news, you will notice that Jerusalem has been in the news lately, right? Big time. This was the little ad that I uh, put out, and it's uh, the battle for Jerusalem, whose capital, Islam or Israel? Do you know the answer to that right now? Well, I said here, the answer may surprise you. And then I put a text, Daniel 11.45. So it gives you the hint that we're going to God's word, right? To see if we can't find the answer. So anytime we go to God's word, I like to ask God's blessing as we open it. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for giving us your word. We thank you for prophecies. And we thank you for this time that we can uh, spend a, a few moments in the book of Daniel to discover some very significant and important information. So bless our time this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. December 7, 2017. You remember that date. That's when President Trump made the announcement and declared that Jerusalem was the capital of Israel. Now that caused trouble everywhere. Why? Because 1,400 years earlier, Mohammed declared that Jerusalem was to be the final capital of the Islamic Caliphate, the capital of Islam. He said that a long time ago. In fact, here's the Hadith, where this statement was made, you can see that was published on uh, December 7 on this website, and they're saying, no, Jerusalem is the capital of the future caliphate. And uh, Mohammed's writing is right there. There's the interpretation of it. And Mohammed said that the caliphate would be placed in Constantinople, and it was there for 400 years. And then it disappeared for a time. It's been gone for about 90 years. And then he said it would come back, and when it came back, it would be established in Jerusalem. And no people will be able to remove it so that it will return to them forever. So that's what Islam teaches. <clears throat> so whose capital will Jerusalem be? Islam's or Israel. Now, next month, the Turkish president is going to visit the Vatican to discuss the status of Jerusalem. When Trump made that statement about Jerusalem, this fellow said, such a step for every Muslim is a declaration of war on all Muslims. And after Trump made that statement, we had some days of rage across the globe. Islam knows that they are to rule the world from Jerusalem. Now, I've got three short little video clips that I'll play for you now. And uh, listen carefully. Uh, well, you can't listen uh, carefully if you don't know Arabic, but you'll be able to read, read carefully the what is being said here on these three videos. One more time. Oh, yeah. Ashiru al-ummat al-islamiyya bi annana naqtarib min maw'id qiyam al-khilafa. Al-khilafa allati satanzilu bayt al-maqdis wa al-khalifa allati sawfa yaftahu filastin bayt al-maqdis. The caliphate will reside where? Jerusalem. The Bayt al-Baqdis and the rule of Islam and to be a Quds Aasima for the Khilafa, by the way. You caught that? Jerusalem will be the capital of the caliphate. Now this next one you might want to turn down because this guy yells pretty loud. So uh, listen to this next one. <laughs> 
ستكون عاصمتنا ليست القاهرة ولا مكة ولا المدينة وإنما القدس إن شاء الله وسيكون هتافنا على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين pretty clear what they want that's what the Muslims want now guess what the evangelicals Christians want they want Trump not to build the wall. What do they want him to build? <laughs> the temple. They think that Trump is the King Cyrus. You know, King Cyrus was the one who allowed Israel to rebuild their uh, temple. And that is what Christians want. So do Christians want the caliphate to be in Jerusalem? No. Israel doesn't want that. So you see why the great battle, the great fight right now. When Trump made that announcement, he like uh, dropped a bomb on, uh, on the, the world, on the controversy here. So whose capital will Jerusalem be? Islam's or Israel's? There's only one place to turn. Nobody knows the future except God, right? says here, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel will stand and I will do uh, all my pleasure, Isaiah 46, 10. So when somebody writes things that are not yet done, we call those prophets. And the prophecy of Daniel is what we're going to look at. Daniel was a prophet. It's in the Old Testament, that book. And uh, Jesus called Daniel a prophet. He said that in Matthew 24, 15. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whosoever readeth, let him understand. So we're supposed to be able to understand what's here that we're going to be looking at in the book of Daniel. <clears throat> that was written uh, 6 BC, 6th century BC. And significant world history from that point in time forward is recorded in this book and recorded before any of it transpired. This text here, and he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Now let me see if I, yeah, I missed a, uh, two slides. Let's look at this one. It is this verse right here, Daniel 11.45. That text right there tells us who will end up with Jerusalem as their capital. Just look at that text there. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Now, this thing does double. Uh, it goes quite a few at a, each time. Maybe I better just push this here. So we've got to find out who this he is, okay? If we could figure out who this he is, we'll know who is going to do all this. Now, in order to figure out how this chapter works, let's go to chapter, uh, verse 1. And so you'll get an idea of how this verse is interpreted. It begins with, also I, and that was, would be the angel Gabriel, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and to strengthen him. And now will I show you the truth. See, this is not a vision. This is an audition. An angel is dictating to, to Daniel. And whenever he says, I will show you the truth, everywhere else where that's being said, it's, he's going to speak in plain language. He's going to just teach Daniel, what this, what's going to be happening? Behold, there shall stand up three kings in Persia, Cambyses, son of Cyrus, Samertus, Darius, those were the three, and the fourth, Xerxes, the king, that's the king in the story of Esther, shall be far richer than they all, and by his strength, through his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. Pretty plain speaking. These are the pictures of those three kings. 
just straightforward history spoken of before it ever took place. Now, if you know your history after Cyrus, uh, well, let's say after uh, Persia went down, what nation came on the scene? Greece. And who was the man who brought Greece into existence? Yeah, Alexander the Great. And it says here, by the age of 30, he had created one of the largest empires in the ancient world, stretching from Greece to Egypt and into the northwest ancient India. He was undefeated in battle and is considered one of the world's most successful military commanders. And so this prophecy goes right into the exploits of Alexander. And it says, a mighty king, that's Alexander the Great, shall stand up that shall rule with great dominion and do with the Persian kings according to his will. And when he, Alexander, shall stand up, his kingdom shall be broken. Alexander died in 323 B.C., and shall be divided towards the four winds of heaven. The four winds means north, south, east, west. And not to his, Alexander's, posterity, nor according to his dominion, which he, Alexander, ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up even for others besides those. By 301 BC, Alexander's kingdom was divided into four parts by his generals who eventually killed Philip his half-brother, and his son, Aegis. So exactly what the prophecy said, that's what history records happened. And these are the four regions that his original empire was divided. You have uh, uh, this green part here is uh, Cassandra, and this is Lysimachus here. This is uh, Seleucus and Ptolemy. Okay, these were the four generals that it divided up into. And then, uh, the, as you go through history, these four kings battled, and finally it ended up with just two. You have the Seleucus uh, there, and in Daniel 11, it's called the king of the, king of the north, and then Ptolemy, it's called king of the south. So those are the two uh, regions that uh, this ends up, Alexander's kingdom ends up being. Now let's look at uh, uh, one of the battles in verse 11. So you see how, it's, how it reads. And the king of the south, that was Ptolemy the fourth, Epiphanes, shall be moved with anger, and he shall come forth and fight with him, Antiochus the third, even with the king of the north, and he shall set forth a great multitude. Antiochus invaded Egypt with 70,000 foot soldiers, 6,000 cavalry, <coughs> and... Uh, uh, cal cavalry and 102 elephants in 217 BC, 217 BC. But the multitude shall be given into his, that's Ptolemy's hand, and Antiochus was defeated at the Battle of uh, Raphia. Okay? So you see how easy, easy it reads. And then in Daniel 11, 25 through 28, it goes through Cleopatra and Mark Anthony, and just goes through that. Uh, if you've ever seen this little video movie they made, Cleopatra, then that's what it's from. It's from these texts right here. Most of the verses of chapter 11 have already found fulfillment in the historical records of that region. And by applying the same method of interpretation used throughout this chapter to the very last verse, we can discover who will be getting Jerusalem as their capital. Okay, let's go back to verse 45. And you see those pronouns. Three, one, two, three, four, five pronouns. We've got to figure out who that pronoun represents. And, and to do that, you've got to go back several verses. In fact, you've got to go back to verse 40. Because 44, 43, 42, 41 keeps using pronouns all the way through, and not until you, you have to go back to verse 40 to get the, who this uh, is talking about. So let's look at verse 40. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, 
and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. So we get the kings of the north and south here. King of the north, king of the south, these are the two. But who is the him? See, that's what we're trying to find out, who the pronoun is. Okay. And all through these chapters, the historians are able to identify every king, every king of the north, every king of the south through history, you're able to actually pin down the king, the name of the king. So we should be able to pin down the name of the king of the south and, and north here in this uh, verse 40. Kings of the north are always ruling that northern territory. And they're, they're a sovereign ruler ruling from that place to be the king of the north. King of the south, same thing. A sovereign ruler ruling from Egypt, from that territory. Then we see that this king of the south pushes at him. We got a him there. And if you, you have to trace that pronoun back, and in the verse just before it, and we won't go into that, but the verse just before is speaking of Napoleon. Uh, and uh, that's a fabulous study just in, of its, in itself. So, but we, we'll just leave it at that. We know that, it's a, uh, that the king of the south is going to push at him. And uh, also, we find out the king of the north will push at him. Okay, so that's some clues uh, as to what we would look for in history to find an application for this verse. And another little nice clue is many ships are going to be involved. So we've got kind of a three-way battle. You've got king of the south pushing at and battling against this power, him. And you've got then the king of the north, the Ottoman Empire, coming and attacking uh, this same uh, power. And many ships are going to be involved with this. And... It's, if you study the history of Napoleon and his uh, campaign in Egypt, there is just an absolute perfect fit for this. Uh, Napoleon came from France, came to Egypt there, and uh, the Malamute tried their best to push him out because he invaded their country, and uh, the, the Madre Bay was the uh, ruler at that time, uh, and, and Abram Bay also. And, uh, and they did their best to push against. But I think in that battle of the pyramids, I think uh, Napoleon lost 300 men, and they lost, Egypt lost 6,000. So uh, Napoleon won that battle. Uh, but uh, then Nelson's ships from England came down and found his ships and destroyed them. So now Napoleon had no way to get home. He's stuck there in Egypt. So he thought, well, what do I do? Well, I'll just go up and conquer Constantinople. You know, I'll take this whole area. So he began the march up there. And you see Gaza and then Jaffa. And, and he, he went to Acre. And uh, then after he conquered Acre, he was going to go to Jerusalem, then on up to Constantinople. So he had it all mapped out. But the king of the north, the Ottoman Empire, declared war and sent uh, the, the horses down and the ships. Russia sent some ships, England had some ships, and, and uh, the Ottoman Empire had ships. And so, and, and Napoleon had no ships. And so they came to, um, uh, he, he, uh, Napoleon put Acre under siege. And, uh, but with the bombardment from the ships and from the, uh, the, the Ottoman power coming down, this was his first defeat, Napoleon's first defeat. And uh, he had to lift the siege and head back to Egypt, and then he took off back to France. So let's put that into the text. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south, joint Egyptian rulers, Madre Bey and Ibrahim Bey, now, let me just say something right here. Interesting. In, in order for there to be a king of the south, 
you've got to have our sovereign ruler ruling from Egypt. But the Ottoman Empire conquered Egypt in the 1500s or so and kept that territory under their power up until 18-something. And so there was no king of the south during that time. The king of the north ruled it all. So how could you have a king of the south? Fascinating. In 1791, uh, uh, Madre Bay and Abraham Bay, they uh, rebelled, had an uprising. And Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire lost Egypt in 1791. And they were now sovereign rulers, these two Mal Malmuk uh, rulers. Now we had a king of the south. And without a king of the south, you could not have verse 40 uh, be fulfilled. And, so, and then, of course, they, uh, in 1801 or so, the, it came back under the Ottoman Empire. So just for those few years, though, there was a king of the south. Fascinating. And so these uh, rulers will push at him, the king of verse 36, who was France and the person of Napoleon. Egypt pushed against the invasion of France in 1798. And the king of the north, that was Caliph Selim III of the Ottoman Empire, shall come against him. The Ottoman, uh, the Ottoman Empire declared war on France in 1798. Like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, and with many ships, Lord Nelson's English fleet of ships supported Turkey in its war with France. And he, king of the north, Caliph Selim III of Turkey, shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. And that phrase, overflow and pass over, is used several other times. And it always indicates who prevailed in the battle that just was described. And, of course, history records that the Turks prevailed. Thus, we can be certain that the identity of the pronoun he, in the, see the yellow he there, we know that that pronoun is the king of the north. This lets us know that the remaining pronouns in this chapter, including verse 45, all refer to the king of the north. And so now we now know who the he and him and his in verse 45 is. It is the king of the north. Now, take a look at that fellow there. That's uh, Caliph Selim III. Just keep that picture in mind because you're going to see it again, all right? And he's the one who is the king of the north in verse 40. So, we know now who the he and him and his and uh, what he's going to do. He sh shall plant the tabernacles of his palace. So this king of the north is going to establish something. What is the tabernacles of his palace? Kind of sounds like a religio-political. Tabernacles has a religious connotation. Palace, civil. So it could be caliphate. And uh, he's going to plant them in the glorious holy mountain. Okay, where's, what's the glorious holy mountain? Well, you can go to Daniel 9.16, and Daniel says, O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from thy city, Jerusalem, thy holy mountain. So, if we look at that glorious holy mountain, uh, it could very well be Jerusalem. I believe it's Jerusalem. And to nail it down for sure, you've got this, between the seas. Okay, because God wants us to know exactly what this verse, this verse is so important. He, he wants us to make no mistakes on this one. So it's between the seas, and sure enough, Jerusalem is between the two seas, Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, let's look at uh, verse, uh, let's read now verse 45 with these things in place. And he, the king of the north, now if this were to happen right now, today, uh, the person who's uh, in power in that region is Erdogan. He's the president of Turkey, and uh, he's the dominant power of that region right now, of what was the Ottoman Empire. 
Okay, he'll plant the tabernacles of his palace, the Islamic caliphate, between the seas, Mediterranean Dead Sea, in the, glor in the glorious holy mountain, Jerusalem. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Something will happen to this person that brings him to his end after he plants the caliphate in Jerusalem. I want you to notice these, uh, some of these news articles. This is uh, from The Atlantic. This is a very reputable uh, journal uh, established in some time in the 1800s. It says, Sultan Erdogan, Turkey's rebranding into the new old Ottoman Empire. And do you see the picture they use? Remember I said, remember that other picture? And they put Erdogan's face there, see? Very interesting. And this here is the, um, uh, another in, uh, significant uh, our magazine, Saudi Wahhabi leaders see Turkish threat over caliphate. And uh, this one here, Turkey's new goals, restore the caliphate and lead the Middle East. An American thinker, Turkey and the restoration of the caliphate. So that's a picture of, uh, of Erdogan. And uh, I want you to uh, watch this uh, this eight-minute video clip that it's going to play now. And uh, the guy talks really fast, so you're going to get a lot of information. So you've got to listen intently to, to get what he's saying. But just notice what he's saying. Hear it twice. On April 16th, the Turkish people went to the polls to show their support for a landmark constitutional referendum. And by Turkish people, I mean barely more than half the Turkish people. And by constitutional referendum, I mean resurrection of the Ottoman Empire. Yes, a minute majority of Turks have bestowed sultan-like powers to Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. He now has the power, nay, the right, to issue decrees, declare emergency rule, draw up budgets, to appoint ministers and top state officials, to dissolve the parliament, and in general overhaul the entire governance system into an executive presidency model that abolishes the office of prime minister. It also allows Erdogan to stay in the presidency until 2029 aka for life. Still, you might be thinking that this is just a consolidation of power, typical of any secular dictator. But the fact is that this is something else entirely. It is a very uh, serious uh, changes are underway for Turkey's future. This referendum was the culmination of a 30-year campaign by Erdogan to not just accumulate supreme executive power, but to remove any obstacles to Islamic rule of Turkey. As one Turkish writer puts it, what this presidential system looks like is the Islamic caliphate system in terms of its mechanism. I think Erdogan clearly sees himself as the founder of the new caliphate, the world Islamic government, uh, with Turkey at its center. The Turkish Ottoman Empire was the last legitimate Sunni Islamic caliphate, ruling over nearly the entire Arab world for 400 years until it was dissolved following defeat in World War I. That's when Mustafa Kemal Ataturk, the George Washington of Turkey, established the Republic of Turkey, a secular, Western-style nation-state, putting in place severe restrictions designed to keep Islam out of the political process at all costs, with the military being, quote, the guardians of democracy, charged with overthrowing the government when it veered too far from the path Ataturk had set. Erdogan's entire career has been defined by an effort to roll back these restrictions, and with this recent referendum, he's finally achieved his ultimate goal. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan once said, democracy is like a streetcar. When you come to your stop, you get off. Back in 1997, Erdogan was a member of the Islamic Welfare Party when it was ousted by the Turkish military and banned from politics for five years. And he actually spent time in prison for espousing violent Islamist rhetoric. He was released in 2001, and that year led his new party, the AK Party, to electoral victory. Since then, he has systematically purged civic life of anti-Islamist and totally destroyed the military's ability to be a check on Islamist ambitions. According to The New Yorker, in 2007, police arrested the first of hundreds of people whom the government accused of forming a secret organization devoted to keeping Islamist aspirations in check. The case spread to include not just former military and police officers, but also academics, journalists, and aid workers, the core of the opposition to the new Islamic order. In all, some 600 people were convicted, including scores of senior generals in the Turkish military and several prominent journalists. But that was just a light dusting compared to the deep clean that took place in 2016. The military coup d'etat attempt in July of that year was the deadliest in Turkey's history and the first to have failed. 
The insurrection was put down, and after he restored order, Erdogan had the excuse he needed to implement the purge he'd always wanted. Over 97,000 public servants were dismissed, and a further 37,000 suspended. Legal action started against 103,000 people, of whom 41,000 are remanded in custody. 158 media outlets were closed, including 60 television and radio stations. More than 150 journalists were arrested, and 10,000 members of the media have lost their jobs, and thousands are awaiting trial for tweets and other social media posts. The end result of this abortive coup was that Erdogan was more powerful than ever, and he had the justification he needed to rid public life of anyone who would stand in his way. It couldn't have worked out better if he'd planned it all himself. Erdogan actually called the coup a gift from God, giving him the tools he needed to create what he called a new Turkey. Well, that new Turkey appears to be a throwback to the very, very old Turkey. As Prime Minister Davutoglu said in 2015 that Turkey will, quote, refound the Ottoman state, or as a parliamentarian tweeted, quote, the 90-year-long commercial break of a 600-year-old empire is now over. This is not just about Turkey becoming more overtly Muslim. This is about using Islam as a unifying force in the region and using historical precedent to reclaim land that once belonged to the Ottomans. It's well known that Turkey has long given aid to the Islamic State. Well, now they're using the problem they helped to create to lay claim to Middle Eastern lands, including the Iraqi city of Mosul and the Islamic State capital of Raqqa. But the Middle East is not the only place where Erdogan's Turkey sees room for expansion. Greece is also on the chopping block, with the Turkish nationalist leader saying if they, the Greeks, want to fall into the sea again, if they want to be hunted down, they are welcome. The Turkish army is ready. Indeed, Erdogan is distancing himself from all of Western Europe, a fact that became clear during the campaign leading up to this week's referendum. About 4.6 million Turkish migrants now live in Europe, with about half of those living in Germany. According to a recent study, assimilation into European society is not a priority for those Turks, with foreigners who come to live in Germany tending to remain strangers even after 50 years and three generations in some cases. This is a state of affairs that Erdogan has no problem with, and in fact actively encourages, saying, yes, integrate yourselves into German society, but don't assimilate yourselves. The place in which you are living and working is now your homeland and new motherland. Stake a claim to it. And as the vote drew near, Erdogan's rhetoric got only more extreme, vowing to mobilize the Islamic world against Eurofascism, saying, quote, This matter is not a matter merely for Turkey. This fascism that shows its dirty face is negatively impacting all Muslims and foreigners living in Europe. But of course, he knows that it's really all the Pope's fault, saying, all the leaders of the EU countries went to the Vatican and listened to the Pope submissively. The situation is quite loud and clear. It is a crusader alliance. April 16th will also be the day to evaluate this. Erdogan is painting the modern international struggle as a conflict between Islam and the West, the Ummah, and Christendom. And the April 16th referendum was confirmation of this view. President Erdogan now has all the trappings of an imperial ruler. The dictatorial powers, the religious underpinnings, control of the media, and even a royal palace. With this referendum, Turkey has revived the Ottoman Empire in all but name. And should they decide to follow through with their imperial ambitions, there would be very little in the way to stop them, and Western Europe would be hard-pressed to defend itself with millions and millions of unassimilated Turkish Muslims already within their border. Turkey is the strongest military power, military might in the region. It's the second largest army in NATO. And the statements coming out of Turkey should be very concerning to Americans. Erdogan is saying 1.5 billion Muslims are waiting for the Turkish government to rise. Demokrasi hiçbir zaman amaç olamaz. Demokrasi ancak ilmi noktada ele aldığımız zaman bir araç olduğunu. So did you realize this was a happening with Turkey? Pretty interesting. Well, the when I wrote this book here, um, this was in 2010. I published it in 2013, but none of this was happening. And uh, so it's fascinating. Most people didn't know what caliphate mean, meant, you know. And so a lot of people now know what, uh, what that word means. But this is uh, the Islamic caliphate uh, back in history. And uh, caliphate is like uh, the papacy is to the Catholic Church. You have a pope with a papacy, 
That's for the Catholics. For Islam, for the Muslims, you have a caliph with the caliphate. And the caliphate was established in, I think, uh, 632 A.D. and went for about 1,400 years and was disbanded in 1928, March 3, 1924, rather. Yeah, March 3, 1924. And, uh, and, of course, they want the caliphate back. They believe that Islam cannot rise to its prominence unless they have a caliph sitting and a caliphate back. So that's what the Muslim Brotherhood formed in, I think, 1928. That's what their purpose is, Al-Qaeda's purpose. That's what, uh, that's what all these groups are wanting. They just want their caliphate back. Turkey party rejects political talks demands caliphate. The, calif the capital of the caliphate, the capital of the United States of the Arabs will be Jerusalem, Allah, uh, 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 Allah willing. Caliphate conference. Some 100,000 Islamists have met in the Indonesian capital, Jakarta, to press for the reestablishment of a caliphate across the Muslim world. Palestinian Authority Chief Judge, Jerusalem will be the capital of the caliphate. Egyptians call for Sharia law, Islamic caliphate. These are all from prominent journals. The rebirth of the caliphate witnessed the reincarnation of the Ottoman Empire on the ashes of Islamic freedom from a match lit by the Muslim Brotherhood. And when that happens, uh, there's going to be some unrest. So then in the book I wrote, I have third jihad. And you know what jihad is, but why third? Well, the first jihad took place between 632 and 750. The second jihad took place from 1071 to 1683. And the third jihad um, we're just seeing the beginnings of it. It hasn't taken place yet. It's still yet future. Uh, this is the territory of Islam by 624 A.D. See the green right there in the circle? That's the uh, territory by that date there. Then by 655, what is that, 30 years or so? This is what the first jihad accomplished. That's their territory during their first jihad. Here is the territory under the uh, second jihad. That's the territory, second jihad. Now, they want the third jihad. And in, in the third jihad, the plan is for Sharia law to encompass the entire world. That is their mandate. That is what their mission is that all peoples be under the uh, rule of Sharia law. Americans, we are your death, they say. Well, notice here what uh, uh, CBS News reported. Despite the Obama's administration's abandonment of the phrase war on terror, the impulses encoded in it still powerfully shape Washington's policymaking as well as its geopolitical fears and fantasies. It adds up to an absurdly modernized vision, version of domino theory, this irrational fear that any small setback for the U.S. in the Muslim world could lead straight to an Islamic caliphate lurks beneath many of Washington's pronouncements and much of its strategic planning. The war on terror is to keep the caliphate from being established. Why? Because of anybody who studies history knows there was about 230 million people who perished in order for that, those first, in those first two jihads. And so the whole purpose is to keep the caliphate from being reestablished. And of course, Islam wants it. So that's, that's the battle we're facing right now. But I wanna, want you to notice Daniel 12.1. And it says, and this is the very next verse after verse 45. There were no divisions of chapters when Daniel wrote it. So verse 45 and Daniel 12, 1 follow each other. And this is what it says. 
And at that time, and so you say, what time? The time that, of Daniel 11.45. When that takes place, when this caliphate gets planted in Jerusalem, there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. There's only one way to survive what's coming, and that's to have your name written in the book. And, and chapter 7 uh, of my book here is all about that, you know, how to get your name written in the book because there's no other, your, your, your bunker is not going to help you during this period of time. You've got to have your name written in the book. Now, this, uh, where'd this all go back here? Let's see. Okay, here we are. So do you see why verse 45 is pretty important for us to understand? And that's what, why the angel gave Daniel these news headlines from this one region of the world. All it is is news headlines, and it's like mile markers so that God's people, Jesus said to watch, right? We're to watch for his coming. We can know how close we are to the second coming or to this close of probation. When Michael stands up, that's what Daniel 12, 1 also says. We can know when we're getting close to that by watching what's happening in this region of the world. So that's what Daniel 11, it's written so simply that, uh, hmm, I guess I'm touching the wrong thing here. It's written so simply that anybody can figure this out. All you need to have is Google and Wikipedia and, you know, the access to the history and then read the text and anyone can chart this, uh, this history. It's a, that's why I love this chapter. It's the, it's the easiest, simplest chapter of prophecy in the whole Bible because it's just so simple. It's just history. And it tells us when we see the caliphate, be, you know, the potential of Turkey doing something in Jerusalem. That's what they want to do. And when they're stating their, this is what they want to do, then you know, and see, God will not allow verse 45 to be fulfilled until he's ready to come back. And so when you see things happening in the Middle East right now, you know, wow, God is, Jesus is ready to come back very soon. And so that's why I think this chapter is so important for us to understand. The battle for Jerusalem. My, uh, from what I've looked at, I say that Islam is going to get it. Not, not Israel, not the evangelical Christians' desire to see the third temple built there. But from this chapter, verse 45, Islam will get this uh, capital. But notice, they're not going to have it for long. Because it says, yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. Now, that's a very significant, because something else is going to happen in that area. Uh, this territory, according to this text right here, tells us that who really is going to end up with that territory. It says, the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with him, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof, and there shall be a very great valley, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day, uh, shall there be one Lord and his name one. So we're being told here that Jesus is going to land on Mount of Olives, and it's going to be a big plain. Something's going to uh, spread out there. And why, why is Jesus going to do this? Well, you have to go to uh, Revelation 21. It says, I, And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, that's the city that's in heaven right now, that's the capital city of the universe, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, 
neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. The former things are passed away. Chapter 11 is just all about warfare. Just right from the beginning to the end. It's all about bloodshed, warfare. It's all going to come to an end. And uh, uh, New Jerusalem, uh, that's the size of New Jerusalem. That's the size of the plain. You see the um, Montana right up through Helena. If you go from there to there, that's about 375 miles. Jerusalem's about 375 miles on each side. And so it fits this part of, of Montana. It's about the size of that. That's going to be Jerusalem and uh, uh, the capital city of the universe. God is going to dwell there. The very center of Jerusalem is going to be the Mount of Olives, and that's where the throne of God will be. And, in, and <clears throat> it's going to be, you know, spread out. It's right now, the Mediterranean is going to have to be covered with some land, you know. It's going to spread out. But when all is said and done, there's still going to be a sea on the um, west, and on the east, according to Zechariah, it's still going to be there. And the, the, uh, the river of life flows to each of those. So it's still going to be there. When all is said and done, Jerusalem is going to be right where it is today on planet Earth with those two seas, but it's going to be God's capital planted there. See, not the caliphate. It's going to be God's capital, and that'll be where he will rule for eternity right from there going to be ma amazing. And um, this book, Great Controversy, amazing book that you, if you haven't read it lately, if you haven't read it, you need to read it because this book starts, the chapter one of this book is all about Jerusalem, the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD with um, Titus. And it, so it goes through that history. And then it goes through a lot of amazing history right on up. The very last chapter deals with New Jerusalem coming down. So it covers from Jerusalem to Jerusalem there. And so you've got to get a copy of that book. Also, uh, pick up a free copy of this book too and the Great Controversy and read those. Any questions? Who do, you, who do you think is going to get Jerusalem as their capital? God will. <laughs> Ultimately, God gets it. That's right. That's the point. That's the important point. But between now and when God finally establishes it, hey, it's, uh, I think the Bible's pretty clear. And uh, we're in for some very interesting times. So, so keep studying prophecy and... Uh, and prepare, get ready, get your name written in that book. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're so glad for, uh, so thankful that you have given us uh, prophecy and you have foretold what the future is going to be. And uh, we're thankful that you send the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth. And I pray that each one of us will, will dig deep into the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation to understand the time we're living in. So bless us, I pray. Dismiss us with your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen.